Okay, so my last lecture, which is also related to my present research, is to go beyond the standard mod. And so we go back to the Doppler cooling, even if we know that it is not the only mechanism. But uh, the Doppler cooling is uh, dominating for small detunings. So when delta, let's say, is smaller or of the order of, of gamma, and especially if you are working at high intensities. So the first point I want to stress is the usual problem. Up to now, in fact, we have always considered a single atom interacting with the laser fields. And if we go on like that, we can do nice things. Spring constant. And the size of the mod. So if you just remember, we had an expression for the spring constant, which was rather awful, but it was in fact just the, the so th this was more or less the, the friction coefficient. So you have h bar kl, and you have something which is related j mu mu b, the gradient of the field, divided by h bar. And if you just now write down that you have something that puts your atom in the center of the, the, the cell, and you have a temperature, then you just write the equilibrium and you just say that the spread in position of your atom is just related to KBT and in the present case it is just the minimum temperature so it is H bar gamma divided by 2 and so you just turn the crank and write delta x squared should be on the order of, let's say, everything is gamma, or gamma half, and so everything disappeared. You take gamma, 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 and you end up with something like j mu b b divided by h bar. And, okay, so if you put now some figures, so k becomes lambda divided by 2 pi. This gamma is 5 megahertz for cesium, 10 maybe for something else, but it doesn't matter. Uh, mu bb divided by h bar, it is... Uh, so, yes, this needs to be, so J mu B is well known, it is 1.5 megahertz per gauss, and you just take a gradient of 10 gauss per centimeter, and so you have 14 megahertz per centimeters, and it means that you have 
10 to the, four, the 3 megahertz per meter and so here it is 1.4 10 to the 3 megahertz per meter and so it turns out that you have something which is 1.5 uh, 0 0.5 10 to the minus 9 meters so your trap is 1 nanometer so if you cool your atoms they should s so maybe there is a factor of 10 somewhere so a few nanometers and if you go to any lab you look at the cloud and in fact the cloud is much 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 larger and oh sorry uh, these were meter uh, <coughs> this squared so sorry so it means that delta x sorry it was 25 <laughs> micrometers but anyhow it is m more reasonable but it is much, much smaller than the observed size, which m very often is on the order of 100 micron for small mods, but more generally one millimeter and even larger. The other important point in this calculation is that this delta x is independent of the number of trapped atoms which is just so you we made the calculation for a single atom, but if you put several atoms, as we always have treated them independently, <coughs> it, uh, it remains independent of the number of trapped atoms. But in experiments, it is well known that the size increases when n increases and so clearly we have we have forgotten something so what did we forget obviously we forget the other atoms <coughs> in the cloud So, all these atoms are just talking to each another and say, I want to sit here, so please go away. So, they are not fermions, but they are still talking. Okay, so. So, I have my cloud. So it is round because I like it to be round. Usually in an experiment it is not so round. <laughs> but it doesn't matter. And so I will just consider uh, two, two, d two beams and forget that I am in, in 3D. I have just E plus in one direction and E minus in... Um, in the other direction. So this is the cloud. <coughs> and in fact, I am considering this atom, this one. Not, not the others, but this is my preferred, preferred atom. Okay, so what is going on for this atom? So usually you just consider that the laser beams have just the intensity given 
by the laser. But in fact, we just have forgotten the absorption by the other atoms. So if I am looking for this atom, the E plus beam has to go across all this big stuff of other absorbing atoms, while the E minus has just only this part. Which means that if the absorption is not completely negligible, the E plus laser beam has been attenuated. So we just write the E plus over dx, x being this direction. So this one is absorbed, so you have just the n of x, this cross-section for absorption, and the intensity of i plus of x, and on the other direction, you have the same you have the same frequency for the lasers, so you have the same uh, cross-section for the absorption, but as the beam is propagating in the reverse di direction, you do not <coughs> have the sign minus sign here, you have a plus sign. And so it means that when you we just write that the force in the uh, was a balance between the I plus and I minus, <coughs> uh, so, sorry, F plus, plus F minus. Usually we just suppose that this we have the same intensity, I plus equal to I minus on the numerator for the two forces. And, but if now we have a, an imbalance between <laughs> the two, we have the usual, we have uh, an extra part, which is just due to the difference in the laser pressures. So it is omega plus squared minus omega minus squared. So it is the intensity uh, mainly. Obviously, you have also some alpha B minus. Uh, so maybe yes, the fourth. Why do I have the opposite sign on my... So, why? Do you agree with that? Yes? Okay, so it's wrong here, but it doesn't matter. So, <laughs> uh, so now I am looking for this atom, so which is... In, and in this case, for this atom, the absorbed, the omega plus squared is smaller than omega minus squared, assuming that the incoming intensities are equal, which means, yes, it, it's okay. It means that the, the force is, the resulting force is in this direction. Obviously, you always have the two other components, but th these, this one, in fact, you can evaluate them with omega plus squared plus omega minus squared divided by two. Because the difference is small, and so the difference on the difference is uh, smaller, and so you just neglect it. Okay, so as the force is in this direction here, Obviously, it will be in this direction here. So this, this is called the shadow effect. I do not 
remember how you write shadow <coughs> like that. Shadow <coughs> effect. And but unfortunately, it is also a compression force. And so it is not the one we are looking for because we have clouds that are, the observed clouds are much larger than the uh, expected size. So we want to have the opposite force. Okay, so what, what is next? So the other effect is now the multiple scattering. And I think I will change the, my piece of chalk. <laughs> okay. So, in fact, in all the processes we have considered up to now, we have always considered that if an atoms here absorb, say, a photon like that, and then radiated a photon in this direction, we just consider that this photon escape the problem and goes to the infinite and is lost forever. But it may happen that on the path of this unfortunate spontaneous photon, there is a cold atom which is already there, and this second atom can choose to absorb this fantastic photon that just passed by. And so, <coughs> if we just consider, so one photon, spontaneous photon, which is emitted by the atom one, and so it means that the atom undergoes a recall delta p in this direction. And you have a second atom here that will absorb <coughs> this spontaneous photon. And so it will have a recall due to the absorption of this, uh, this photon in the, this direction. So if now you are looking at this process, if you just forget that you have an exchange of excitation also, you have two momentum kicks in opposite direction for the atom one and the atom two due to mediated in a, in a way by this photon. And it can be seen just as the effect of a force acting during this time interval. And so here we have found a repulsive force between the two atoms. So if we want to know, this is just by chance that this atom was on the path of the photon and we have we have to compute the probability for such an event to occur. And so obviously you have a reabsorption cross-section and you have also to divide it by the distance between the two atoms because if the atom two was, were here and the photon emitted here, this one, this guy will not never see this photon. So here, this reabsorption cross-section is a priori different from the laser cross-absorption cross-section 
because in fact it depends on the emission spectrum of this atom while the absorption was just a, a laser and a laser has just one frequency and so a priori the spontaneous photon has a different frequency as the absorbed one and so you just expect that this reabsorption uh, cross-section is simply different uh, from this one. Typically, if you just consider the dressed atom picture and the typical spe emis emission spectrum uh, for, okay, I don't know what I am plotting. This is the frequency. You have the famous Molo triplet All these are lower entrants, and so this is the laser frequency, and you have a blue sideband, and so this is omega L plus the generalized gravity frequency, while this is omega L minus the generalized gravity frequency. And so if you want to know what this cross-section is you have to take into account this emission spectrum and look at the absorption by an atom which is already in presence of light fields. So it is not a bare atom that is absorbing this Moro triplet. It is a dressed atom that absorbed the, this uh, spectrum. Okay, I will not do the calculation on, on the board. You can do that. It is rather lengthy, but uh, you, you just have to... And the result, the net result, is that you have a reabsorption cross-section which is usually larger than the absorption for the laser. One of the reasons for that so, just hand-waving arguments, is that here you have the blue component of the Molo triplet, which is closer to the resonance. Because, in fact, the, uh, the generalized Rabi frequency is just delta 2 plus omega squared. And so, if you just take a small intensity, it is just delta. And so if you just now compute omega L plus delta, fantastic, it is omega naught. Because delta is omega naught minus omega L. No? No. no. Yes. Yes, sorry. This is minus delta because it is. Uh, it is plus absolute value of delta. Okay, and it turns out to be omega zero. And so this component is strongly absorbed. O okay, so this is not an obvious result. But the argument is this one, and it seems to work. Okay. <coughs> now, the big question the big, the big one, is to know if we go to an equilibrium, oh, too many wiggles, and or not. And the opposite of equilibrium is instabilities. Okay, so if you go back in the past with a very simple model, you just consider that you are at t equals zero, and you are just assuming that you have an equilibrium, which means that now you have 
the force due to the mod, the usual minus V minus KB, uh, KX. You have the force which is related to the shadow effect. And you have the force due to the multiple scattering. And you just say this is zero. So if you have, if you assume that this force is just uh, something which is minus uh, kr, and if this one, you are in the nice regime where the variation of intensities are not too high, it's also which will give you something which is a k prime a compression force which is isotropic. And so this one, uh, so I erase it, but no, it's here. So in fact, it is a Coulombian, a, Coul a Coulomb force as the one that is exerted between two charged particles. And then, <coughs> you use arguments coming from electrostatics and you calculate the, for instance, the divergent, divergence of this. And you find that it is, so the divergence of this is just zero because the sum was zero. And the divergence of this you can calculate easily, this one also, and the Coulomb force, you know the divergence also. And it allows you to demonstrate that this equation lead to a constant atomic density in the cloud. And it gives, so thi this is, so you have as a matter of fact, a sphere which is filled, nothing to do with the Fermi sphere. We have classical atoms. But, and so th uh, the usual reference is the paper by Sesco. I do not remember if it is a K or not. So, uh, in uh, the Josa B99, 91, yes. So, a long, long time ago. And so if, the, in fact, the, the atomic density is just related to the sigma r, r minus sigma l and something like that. And the conclusion is that now, if you increase n as the density is constant, then you, the size of the cloud has to increase also uh, as the third power of n. And so if now you want to relax this condition because you just want to consider the fact that you have a finite temperature, in fact, very as usual, when you have a finite temperature which is not too high, you have here an, a constant density. And here, the only thing that can happened is that instead of having here on the border a huge step, a vertical step, you will just have a smaller, a smoother. Uh, so this is the position. This is the usual zero temperature. And typically, this is the delta x due to temperature, which is related to the spring constant you had previously. Okay. So this treatment is fine, but it starts from the hypothesis that you have an equilibrium and there is nothing in the calculation that tells you if 
you will reach this equilibrium of, or not. And maybe you have done the experiment if you are an experimentalist and if you have a nice smart uh, able to trap a lot of atoms, then you just, at the beginning, you just play with the detuning, you play with the intensity. And sometimes you can observe uh, the loading of the mod. And this is, uh, for instance, it is uh, published in a paper by Robin Kaiser, who will be there in the uh, next week. He was loading, loading a mod. And so this is the total number. So it was the fluorescence of the mod and time. So you just trap more and more atoms. OK, fine. And suddenly, he observes something more or less like that. With a time scale on the order of one second. So obviously, when you are beginning, you can say, OK, this is my laser lock that is playing some bad tricks or things like that. But you check everything. And, and so it can happen that you see such uh, behavior in your experiment. It just means that the fundamental hypothesis that was here is not fulfilled. OK, so how can we now describe our problem in a convenient and not too ugly a way? Because if it, if, it, if it becomes ugly, you are not very happy. So the natural idea is, so I was the same simple model. So now I switch to the phase space. And I will try to write things for the phase space density and try to write uh, an equation. So the phase space just means that I am considering this, the phase space density, and which, so sometimes it is called F, sometimes it is called Rho, and also other names. Uh, but you know, even with another name, a rose is still a rose. And um, so to avoid problems, we have, in some sense, to separate the hot background atoms and the cold one. So this is done just by putting an artificial separation somewhere in P between the, the cold sample and the hot background. So when, we ha when you have a phase, phase density like that, so obviously I will remain in one dimension. So R will become X and P just loses its arrow. And so the first uh, sp spontaneous idea, kinetic equation, is to write the kinetic equation as did uh, Misha uh, a few hours ago, which consists just in writing then d over dt of rho of x, p, and t <laughs> is just d over dt of rho plus v d over dx of rho plus the force and d over dp of the same rho. And this is related to the collisional terms. OK. So, but usually, the kinetic equation is derived in a case where the force do not depend on the velocity. And we are just now considering a force which is proportional 
to the velocity, so it is a, a, a cooling force. And it means that if you make the calculation properly, this term has just to jump into the differential. And so you end up with the Vlasov Vlasov ZV equation, which is mainly the same, except that you have d over dp of f rho. <coughs> the, the next step is also that we, you remember, we have a Brownian motion. due to the fact that the atoms are scattering photons and the photons are going in a, a different uh, direction. And so you, respect to the previous equation, you have to add an extra term, which is d squared over dp squared of a diffusion coefficient times rho, okay? So up to now, it's okay. You just have a more lengthy equation. And this equation has a name, so I will write it. And so it is P divided by M D over D X of rho plus uh, D over D P of F rho and you have a d squared over d, d squared of d rho, and it is always the collisional terms. Okay, so this is the so-called Blasov Fokker Planck equation. Okay, uh, this is a very popular equation if you are just doing <coughs> plasma physics, if you are looking at what happens in the center of a star, then very often this is a common equation. The problem is that it is really ugly. Um, so we can also discuss the collisional terms. And in fact, what can happen to uh, unfortunate atom that is sitting in the cloud of cold atoms. It can be kicked away by a hot atom from the background. And so you have a lost term, which is just a row divided by some typical collisional time. And so, but you have also the reverse process that can occur and you can imagine that two hot atoms just collide somewhere in the, in, in the, the space where the laser beams are crossing. And these two hot atoms that collide will leave an atom which falls in the range of, uh, of momenta that we are interested in. Okay, so... It looks sim simple, isn't it? <laughs> but, but obviously, the force, the force, depends, and so th the d diffusion coefficient also depends on the i plus and minus calculated at the position where the atom is sitting, and. So they depend on the integral over P of the density rho of X, P, and T. And so you have this quantity that depend on rho, and they enter in an equation which gives you the evolution of rho. So you are typical, uh, typical system, which is a non- linear coupled and 
you are lucky because you can also add it is partial derivatives mm -hmm. and you end with equations at the core okay so just to say that you can tell nothing So, uh, in fact, in, in this term, I consider <laughs> any, uh, w what can happen with any collider. It can be the background uh, gas of <laughs> my cold atoms, but it can be also uh, some impurity that is going around. I do not care. This is just any phenomena that will kill my atom from the, 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 the cloud of cold atoms. La lambda is a repopulation of the so-called cold sample by a collision between two hot atoms. In fact, it, it always happened that two hot atoms just collide and one goes out with most of the energy, leaving this other one just going slowly. And as I have made a kind of artificial separation between what is, is hot and what is cold, but uh, there is a natural parameter to make this cut which is given by the capture range of the Doppler cooling mechanism, for instance. So maybe within a factor of two, three, five. So, but there is a natural range for the velocity where if an atom is t fast, faster than this, you will not capture it in the laser beams. So there is, uh, uh, really something. Okay, so if you do not trust this just hand-waving arguments, you can make the full calculation just, it is rather easy in fact. And I, uh, I find it now nice, so I will tell you how to do that. Okay, so now you just have this object, rho of x, p, and t. Maybe we can forget t, so no. Um, and you just consider a box. And in this box, so this box is large enough, but small enough, so we will uh, uh, tell what does that mean. You have just delta x, delta p, the size of the box. And so you have a number of atoms in this box at the time t. And this is just rho of x, p, and t times delta x, delta p. And now the question is at t plus delta t, what are the things that can happen to this number of atoms? So the first uh, trivial thing is just to say that here, the, the atoms are just traveling with a given velocity. So you will have, if you consider this part, which is, uh, which has a width V delta T, as the atoms that are here just are traveling in this direction with a velocity V, in V delta T, they will be here. 
And on the other hand, if you just take the atoms that were here in V delta T, they will go out. And so you have a first delta N, which can you, you can evaluate like that, which is the just the for this horizontal displacement and so it is V delta T which is the width times delta P which gives you the area and here you have to multiply that by rho of x minus delta x divided by 2 and p and t and these one are so these one are coming in and you lose those that were on the other side and you are very happy because you find here the rho of uh, dx delta x and with v and with delta t and this is just this term here fantastic okay so what can happen also so this is due to the velocity now what can happen is the collisions. So the collisions, everything happens here, but you have a delta n due to collisions, which is just the number of atoms that were sitting here. Uh, and you have a delta t divided by tau, which is the chance that a collision occur. So times rho delta x delta p, which was the sim simply the number of atoms that were there. Okay, now the last thing, which is slightly more difficult to understand and to catch and to, is obviously the last part and it is to understand what can happen here and there and in fact this is a change in momentum because this is x and this is p so if you can move some atoms from here to here or from there to there or here to here or there to from there it means that you have changed the momenta. So you have to write something decent to understand what is going on. And the simplest way is just to say that the atom is just undergoing a change in, its mo in momentum because it absorbed a photon in one beam and or in the uh, the multiple the scattered light so it absorbs one photon and it re emits a photon so this is nice because the q is finite is between uh, plus and mi uh, minus uh, two h bar k and so it means that everything will happen in these two windows two h bar k and here and there and uh, now you will say that you have a probability in x p and t to undergo this moment to have this momentum kick per unit of time and then you just have to calculate everything and at the end you will obviously find these two terms 
provided that you define the force as the the integral of q and every uh, and pi of x p t and q and the diffusion coefficient the integral of q squared pi of the same thing and just working out looking at what is going on in and out from here from there from here from there you just just as you have <laughs> some atoms that are here that can go there and some atoms that are here and that go there you see that you already have a derivative of d rho divided uh, on position calculated on this side so this is in p equal uh, so if the center is p naught minus delta p divided by 2 and here you have the same process so you have here also uh, something which is but calculated on p p0 plus delta p divided by 2 and so at the end you will have to make the same thing as here and the difference between the delta p the d over dp here and the d over dp here will give you the d2 over dp squared of d rho and obviously the factor you will have will also be the delta p because it is the difference between these two and so you will always in each if you make the thing correctly you will always have your delta n for the p which is also something and you have to end with delta x delta t delta p otherwise it means that you fail somewhere and so here you have delta x the delta p comes from the difference when you replace the difference between the two by the derivative and the delta t is just that if this is the probability per unit of time the chance that you have an event is this multiplied by delta t okay so maybe do you have some questions yes yes Yes. No. <laughs> so it depends uh, crucially on the intensity of your laser, on the detuning of your lasers, and on the background pressure. <coughs> and also, of if you have a repumping laser, if you change the repumping laser, then you you change the efficiency of the cooling mechanism and so you, you change everything. But the, 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 the knobs that you have are the intensity of the lasers and the, the, so the main knobs are the intensity of the lasers and the detuning of the lasers. And so if you work in the usual uh, range of two gammas, where, uh, minus two gammas, almost everything is still in this region. You can put any power in your laser. If your detuning is large enough, then you are quite safe. But if you, you change the frequency of your laser and you go closer to the resonance, because you have mm, just like that the idea that it will improve the, 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 the the feeling rate of your knot, you will have more atoms. If you want to have a big knot with uh, plenty of atoms, you crank, you, you put the detuning uh, slightly 
uh, closer to the, the resonance. And very often, you observe this kind. So in the room, are there people that have observed that? Just so you? Yes? <laughs> OK, so two. But it's not, not many, but usually when you have uh, a good supervisor, he, he will tell you, do not go in this region because it is ugly. <laughs> And obviously, if you are just working with a mod to prepare uh, Bose-Einstein condensate or something or something else, then clearly you have to avoid any region where you can have instabilities, because when you have instabilities, you cannot know exactly what will be the number of atoms that are available at that time. So I have been a bit short, but I have still some pictures. Yes? The, the time scale? <laughs> it is a good question. I don't know. So wha what I know is that uh, you can observe uh, periods of a few seconds. And uh, but um, up to now, so yes, we, we have made some simulations and some calculations. So first, just show some real examples, if it works. OK. No? Yes? Yes. OK. Just forget uh, about the things that are behind. I don't know why they are still there. No? OK. Mm -hmm. Let's try again. Yes. OK. So this is a typical, so obviously a typical in the sense of the publications um, plot. So this is just what we have observed now more than 10 years ago, where you have the number of atoms. And we observe, in fact, simply the mod with a four quadrant photodiode. And so the experiment was quite crude, if we can say. Because you have the mod here, we put a lens here, and mainly we have a four quadrant photodiode. So in, in one uh, you have uh, one quadrant here, one one and more uh, out, and so to see, and we use one beam in this direction, and we put a mirror to uh, make the pair of the beam. This has a, a big advantage, is that the shadow effect is doubled, and it also moves the old trap, because the, the, coming, the beam, which is coming back, uh, is has a lower intensity than the uh, forward-going beam if you have a lot of atoms. So the, the, at the atomic cloud will move in this direction when the number of atom of trapped atom is increased. And so if you just center your detector here, you just have to make the difference between the two and you can have an idea of the motion, the position of the cloud. And this is what is plotted here. You 
have the number of atoms that is going on, the position, which move smoothly, and suddenly something occur. And you lose a lot of atom, and then you refill your cloud, and again, the position goes very far, and you lose some atoms, and so you have this. And this is per perfectly reproducible. You just have this one day, you <coughs> turn back the next day, you put the same uh, uh, detuning, the same intensity, the same repumper, and you obtain the same thing. Maybe not exactly the same period, but the same uh, overall um, form. And you see the period is not exactly one second, but uh, not so far. And we have no time scales of that order I in the problem. If you just consider the cooling uh, mechanism, the typical time scale is a few milliseconds. Maybe the collision time can be on the order of this order, but mm, mm, probably not. So, uh, in fact, in this case, so we have built some models where you, you just, so this is a much simpler s system because you have n not to treat explicitly the multiple scattering. You just consider that in your cloud you have a constant density, and so you have directly a relation between the number of atoms and the size of the cloud. And so the size of the cloud tells you everything. And you just write the equation for the total number of atoms in the cloud. OK. We have also observed another regime, which is really ugly, because it is stochastic intensities, which means that sometimes <coughs> the noise so this is just the fluorescence. The noise is increased, and it seems almost periodic. So obviously, when you observe this, you first try to look if your neighbor in the next room has not turned on a, a pump or something which makes noise on the line, or you check that your laser lock is not oscillating as a, a crazy guy. And so you have a lot of troubles when you observe that because um, it is stochastic, which means that it can happen or it may not. And so you just have to wait. You rec record fluorescence for years, so no minutes. And sometimes you see this. This is just no noisy. And then here, probably, you have still the same kind of uh, behavior. And so you can also take some picture of your MOT. So this is just the, the, the average uh, fluorescence of the MOT. So it is not so spherical. You, you, you always imagine a spherical MOT. But here, you have a lot of atoms. But you have a tail here. And what we have done, so this, this kind of images are recorded with a high-speed uh, CCD camera. And so for, in this case, we use um, um, 400 uh, frames per second. And what we did is that for each pixel of the camera, where you have some signal, because obviously you have a lot of pixels where you have nothing, we have made the Fourier transform of the, the intensity I pixel by pixel. So this is just a program. So you do not, you, you just have to write the program. Uh, afterwards, it, it works alone. And we observe a peak uh, at 20 hertz. And, but the peak, the maximum of the fluctuation as, at 20 hertz is here, which means that the instability is not, absolutely not, in the center of the cloud where the density is maximum, but it occurs somewhere here. So the main problem we have 
in this situation is that we were looking just with a camera, let's say here, and it is difficult to know what the atoms are doing in the mod because we have only a 2D image of what happens. And so it was a suggestion by Hélène a few years ago, but we did not have time to implement it, was to take, a s play with some mirrors and put on the same camera the two points of view from different directions so that we <coughs> will be able to reconstruct the 3D motion of the atoms and at that point we will have more information and maybe we will understand something. We have made also another treatment for these images which is the principal component analysis which is in fact uh, a way to find the principal mode of uh, excitation and the, the problem we have is that we have uh, almost no correlation between the Fourier analysis, which is this one, and the PCA mode. And probably the reason for that is that we, have, we are dealing with a real special temporal instability, inst in unstable system. And so the PCA looks at the special instabilities, the Fourier transform looks to the temporal instabilities, but if you mix both, then none of them will give you uh, good signals. And so we are at that point, and I think I will stop here. So I can speak for hours, but I think that you are a bit tired, and so, no, no, Ellen, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. No. So what what we did uh, for uh, as a simulation is just for this system when you consider only the center of mass motion. In this case, we have uh, so in in fact <laughs> you have some um, some bistability branches like that uh, so y your system change the position if you uh, change a parameter for instance the detuning and so this in this in s this kind of nonlinear behavior you this 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 branch is unstable and so when you arrive here, you jump there. And if you come back, you will jump here. And if you have, so not so pronounced S, but just a, a sharp, just the, the intermediate case, then if you are somewhere here, you can have very easily stochastic instabilities. In the sense that any, any noise in the experiment, in the in environment, any, anything will change drastically the, the response of the system. And so uh, this can, so this was done in this system, which was very simple one. Um, we are now trying to discuss with guys that use the Fokker-Planck the vlasov fokker planck equation to study the instabilities of the electron packet in a, in a free electron laser. So a completely different thing, but they are just the next door. Uh, so we are working in the same lab and so they have uh, done simulations. <laughs> so we are discussing with them to know if our system can fit their uh, program or not. The problem is that you have also uh, several uh, different timescales. Typically, the cooling mechanism 
take place at uh, the millisecond time scale. And so here, the typical time scale was 20 hertz, which means so not so far from the millisecond time scale. May, but on the, the previous uh, slide and on the experiment by Robin, the typical time scale is the second. And to, if you want to run simulation where the basic step to understand the physics is the millisecond, and you want to integrate that uh, on a time scale which is several seconds, then it becomes difficult. So, but we, we, we have not lost hope, so everything is fine. Yes? Yes, yes, I have uh, all the reference you want. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I can sh try to write them down and, uh, yeah. and in the, in the I will give you them maybe to, to Mathilde so, so that uh, she can put them on, uh, on the web. Other questions? Yes? This is just the, the X and Y position on uh, the pixel of the, the camera. And the, the right one? It is the same, the, they are the same pixels. But here, in fact, so here it is the, the, the inten sim simply the intensity pixel by pixel. And here what we have done is that we have, for each pixel, we have the time sequence the time evolution of the intensity. We take the Fourier transform of it, and as we observe a peak at 20 hertz, we just take the maximum of this peak, the maximum intensity of this peak at 20 hertz, and put it here. So, no, for each pixel, it is the, the height of the <laughs> peak at 20 hertz. It is a, a, a frequency analysis of the image. Okay. I stop here.